another episode of Papa Culture with Lilith Dorsey and Jason Winslade, where we dig into the crossroads of occultism, <laughs> popular culture, and media. I'm Lilith Dorsey, MFA, author, filmmaker, and voodoo priestess. I'm Jason Winslade, performance studies, media studies, and religious studies scholar. And we are back today uh, talking about the next uh, stage of our kind of witch mini series. And today we're talking about Witches of Eastwick, cl a classic from 1987. This is great, man. I love this. And it, there were so many memories that this film brought back for me, you know. 87, I was a senior in high school, and I just have to start out by saying, even though this has nothing to do with my academic background, I owned that mofo car. That was mine. That was my first car. That was my graduation present. I used to drive around <laughs> in the Mercedes, in the vintage Mercedes. It was fantastic. We used to have parties in there, me and all my friends, and it was great. I felt like properly evil. Lilith. Wow. There's just a lot of stuff that, 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 you know, sparked my, my memory, but also just re realizing that it probably was rated R, and I was but I was really taken aback by the, the language. Like I was wasn't expecting like the f bombs and the. Uh, I mean, there's not that much of them, but still. Uh, anyway, so put, putting this into the context of the the history of witchcraft on film, um, and 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 you know presentations of the occult and all that. When we think about you know our last episode, we talked about the Wizard of Oz. Obviously, you know, 1939 is a, is a huge difference from 1939 to 1987. Yes, uh, big jump. I mean, right. I mean, we could go into all the different stages. And, you know, there, there's some of, the, some of this historical filmic context. Uh, again, I'm drawing on Heather Green's Bell Book and Candle, or no, <laughs> Bell Book and Camera, A Critical History. Of you got to plug our friend Heather Green. You got to get her book right. <laughs> yes, I should get her book right. Okay, I was I was thinking the movie, of course, that she writes about as well. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, and we're going to have Heather on hopefully soon uh, to talk about some of this stuff. But uh, but yeah, the various stages of the way that not only the occult is presented on film uh, in terms of whether or not it's you know magical or fantasy or or whether it's satanic or whether it's a, a, a you know a religion any of that stuff, all of that evolves quite a bit, not to mention the way that women and their roles as witches evolve and are portrayed. And so thinking about 1987 and, you know, those of us old timers who were around back then, um, we're at the tail end of the Reagan era. Um, we are at a point where in contrast to the 70s, where pretty much it was a free-for-all with Rosemary's Baby and Carrie and all that stuff, where it was like, okay, we're going to, I mean, that, those were like the, the high-end stuff, but, you know, you had Romero and, and, and um, uh, uh, Roger Corman doing all these, like, you know, uh, low-budget things where it's basically, it's sexploitation, it's, it's, you know, whatever they can get away with on screen, they're going to do. Um, it was after the, uh, in the late 60s, after the, um, the, the censorship standards changed and the MPAA came into being with the rating system and all that. Uh, so the 70s was a free-for-all. And there was a lot of, uh, it was dark. Well, I mean, the MPAA was around before that. <laughs> no, no, there were, there were versions. There was, the, there was something called the, the PCA yes. uh, that was then, uh, that was much stricter. Um, and then when the MPAA came about, it was like, okay, well, as long as, it's, <clears throat> as long as it's rated R, you can do all this stuff. Um, but in the, yeah, so, so, so in the seventies, it's not only that, it's not only that, the, the, you know, the, there could be more sex and violence, but there was a lot more moral ambiguity in terms of, you know, evil characters aren't necessarily punished and things like that. Um, whereas in the eighties, uh, when, you know, once we got out of, uh, of the, the period of, of malaise in the late 70s and the Reagan era came about, that's when things started to get more conservative again. And there was a lot, there were a lot more, uh, you know, moral 
uh, I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily a, like a rule, but just in well, general. But I mean, Nancy Reagan went after everybody with, you know, lyrics and, sh and films and, and all of these things, all of these manifestations of sexuality or drugs are the things that you're talking about, things that in the 70s we would have thought of as commonplace, where now they've become, we have to cast them in this light. And, and I think this really does propel in a lot of ways where this is coming from. You know, you looked at Heather Green and, and I looked at that too. And I looked at, you know, there was an article by Thomas Van called Jack Nicholson, Women and the Price of Admission, where he talks about these themes of madness, the diabolical and gender revelations. And for me, wow. these are some of the three major things that we're looking at in this film. And this, this balance between witchcraft and the diabolical, I think, is something that right. we haven't really gotten in this particular structure before cinematically. We've certainly had the diabolical and we've had other iterations of witches, but this is sort of them almost coming to a head or a crossroads if we want to continue yeah. our bizarre theme of limited. I mean, we, we get to the, when we, you know, when we, when we get to the, the, the film itself, I mean, I think there's, there's some um, very strong cultural context set up in the film uh, for that kind of discussion. And in fact, the, the, the Felicia character, who's sort of the, the Bible bouncer, um, you know, she, she I, I kind of saw her as almost a Tipper Gore stand in, you know. Oh, like definitely, a, definitely. The MRC thing going like, oh, all these evil, whores, whores, you know. Um, <laughs> so, 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 you know, again, like at, at, the end, at the end of the 80s, and we're also, we're also keep in mind, we're at the point where the satanic panic is in full bloom, but that's a analogy you'd want to use for satanic panic. Um, but that, you know, that started in the early 80s and that's it, still going on at this point. So there's still a lot of this cultural fear over Satanism, especially, you know, uh, how Satanism is going to uh, corrupt the children and all that. Um, I mean, I, it's never really gone away, but there were, um, you know, strong elements of it in the late 80s. So again, you have this, this conservative movement in which any sort of deviation from standard gender norms is, is ultimately punished at this point um, in, in, in pop culture. Uh, and there, there's some few, a few rare exceptions, but that's kind of how it stands. Um, so other things to, to know as going into the movie is that, of course, it's uh, based on a novel by John Updike, published in 1984. And again, you know, this is a, a like many of these films, written by a man, directed by a man, um, directed by George Miller, which I don't think I put that together. Mad Max. <laughs> Mad Max. <laughs> uh, the, the, the guy who later, you know, later on would create one of the, uh, or help create one of the, you know, strongest iconic feminist heroes, uh, Furiosa is behind this thing back in the 80s. So uh, figure that out. Um, so yeah, in the, in the, in the book, uh, uh, there, I mean, there are, some, there are some clear differences, and Heather Green points them out in her, in her book. There are some clear differences in the way that the witches are portrayed. And in, in the book, I guess they're, they, I, I have to confess, I've never read it, um, but they are more, uh, they, they more willingly pursue magic in the book whereas in the movie they kind of stumble it's sort of, yeah it's an accident it's like they don't even know that they can do magic whereas right. the book they're actively witches which i find interesting because you know there's opinions on both sides from men women all sources as to whether or not the book is a feminist text whether or not the film is a feminist text and people really don't seem to agree in any way shape or form i mean yes these witches in the novel are supposed to be more actively witches they're supposed to be more empowered but they're also in a lot of ways more venomous whereas as these witches are seen as kinder gentler versions of the one in the novel and i think that the the thing that struck me as when i was watching it was the lack of jealousy and apparently that is not present at all in the novel the novel is sort of driven by jealousy and it's what makes them sorry spoilers it's what makes them end up killing in the novel so <laughs> okay oh yes they are more they are more violent yeah i mean there, there's a there's a brief there, there, that silly you know tennis tournament episode uh, uh, scene 
where there where there's some jealousy spinning, that they, spinning spinning right, yeah they get over it really quickly i guess you know there's some metaphor about his balls in the air i don't know um so so when the movie starts out right one of the first things you see is share shares character uh alexandra carving basically venus of willendorf knockoffs right yes Archetypes. she sort of has she sort of plays the crone role um, Michelle Pfeiffer with all the kids, who's super fertile, obviously, is the mother role. Susan Sarandon is the burgeoning maiden who's, who's I mean, we, we know she's not a virgin, but, but, but there's still the, 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 the sense that she's, her sexuality is repressed and being released by, you know, Daryl Van Horn and all that stuff. So she kind of fulfills the maiden thing. I mean, I so, think they're archetypal in so many ways. You know, I think right. in some ways Cher's almost t- typecast as this dark lady persona that we've seen her, you know, craft for herself as the Cher brand overall. Yeah, and her character is like, the, you know, she, she's the most forthright, the most, uh, she's the most willing to stand up to, to Jack Nicholson and all that. And, you know, and again, the like seeing that scene where he's basically, where he first gets her into bed, where he's basically doing the pickup artist thing where he's, He's complimenting her, but negging her at the same time. Yeah. And she's like, you're so repulsive. Why would I ever even think about? And yet he still sort of worms his way in and says, what have you basically, what have you got to lose? Like your, your, you know, your life sucks. You know, you should, you know, and she falls for it and is in bed with him. I wouldn't so. say worms his way in. I would say snakes his way in. And I brought my okay. snake. And I'm wearing my snaky dress because (laughs) we've got this, you know, that you can wiggle your way in, you know, you can have this kind of horny devil that goes with blood, it goes with ire, and it also comes with creative passion, which is the thing that I thought was fascinating. Yes, he challenges her in every level, and then he sort of does, you're right, like this mea culpa thing, you know, which is, I guess, ultimately attractive and and makes appeals to the top in her and makes her want to go through with it. Yeah, there's, when when I was looking at, when I was looking at what Nicholson's character was, because the first, the first thing um, well, actually, even, even before we get to him, I, th- I think it's important to, to sort of set the scene in, in that town. Now, it's, it's Eastwick, but it's basically Salem, uh, right? Like, it, 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 it kind of has See, that. I would argue with you again about this because I lived in Rhode Island for 10 years. So for me, this is very clearly Rhode Island again. We are okay. looking at Rhode Island again. We're Fair looking enough. at something that was, you know, founded on religious freedom. That's the, you know, you ask anybody who's been there for five minutes, that's the one thing they're going to shove down your throat. So we've got this place where, yes, Salem is a witchy place, but Rhode Island is kind of like a witchy place in exile, I think, in a lot of ways, where somebody as powerful as these women and also this man can survive and thrive. Yeah, I mean, it, it is that, it is definitely that, that New England setting that, that is both puritanical and, and, you know, somewhat suburban too. Um, I, I think it's really important to note that the scene in which, um, you know, they, they, they talk, the, the, the women talk later on about how, you know, oh, I was thinking the same thing. I was hoping that, that uh, you know, the, the, the rains would come. So they're, they're at a school, a, a civic function, where the guy who I believe is the principal of the school, who, who we, you know, we, we know that he's a scumbag. He's already sort of sexually Grabbing harassed. Her ass. Yeah, he's grabbing around, sexually harassed Jane, and uh, uh, and he and he does this whole thing and the speech. So he's he's sort of like he's the patriarch, right, of the town. Um, even though it's like you know he's a principal, he's a mayor. I don't know what he is. <laughs> Some sort of public official. Right. He's giving. We we know he's a scumbag. He's giving this speech, and at the beginning of the speech, he 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 sort of makes a. Uh, a gesture towards gender neutral language or, or you know saying like the town's town's person instead of the t- whatever but then his, the speech itself even though it's you know we're not meant to listen to the speech at all but if you do the speech is very much about um women understanding their roles mm-hmm. and about the importance of male heroism and the importance of patriarchy uh, you know, it, it, it's very much about how, you know, this, this, this is the standard societal role that you are meant to, you know, whether you're a man, you know, whatever it was, whether you were a man or a woman in this town to fulfill. 
And it's that speech that gets interrupted by the storm. And I, and I now that I think about it, I can't help but wonder if if there was a, a strong reference at the end of season three of Buffy with the mayor's speech at the graduation. Yeah, that yeah. By the, <laughs> Where the storm comes, yeah. There's a strong connection there. I hadn't, I hadn't put that together until then. But yeah, so there's, there's this clear sense of like, this is the patriarchy, but so the, the you know, the Well, yeah, it's like an evil, misogynist, slut-shaming speech, which we get repeatedly right. in the narrative, but you know. But it's not out of the norm of the time. At all? No, of course not. Of course Very not. Very much like this is your civic duty. Oh, this sure. Is, uh, p- patriotism and and uh, you know uh, your religious and civic roles, right? So and and that's where and that's where the trick lies. And this is where I'm, you know, this is where I start to wonder about the politics of the film, right? So the women are, you know, th- they imagine that this gets shut down and it happens with the rain and all that, and it's at that point that you know, uh, uh, Daryl Van Horn arrives in the town. And of course, they, they, they show, you know, the, 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 them getting together and having their talk about men and like how like, you know, oh, we don't need men, but why do we always talk about them and all this kind of stuff, you know, anti <laughs> Um And he shows up during this, but he's already, he's already clearly on his way before he, they start talking sure. about him. So they really invoke him, but that's the connection. Well, they're never really sure exactly of what their powers are. And this is a theme that keeps coming back over and over and over again. And I think that this is something that troubled a lot of people at the time. You know, I I can't move forward anymore talking about these women without talking about, you know, at the time, this was something that was revolutionary for those of us who knew we were witches and were active witches at this point, because we were dealing with Lori Cabot, who, you know, had such a visceral response to the film and to how witches were portrayed in the film. And I, I think, again, a lot of this had to do with the fact that it wasn't an active thing. But in this, um, the dates in this article that I have are wrong, but it ended up in her forming the Witches League for Public Awareness, which is now called the Witches Civil Liberties League. So there were a lot of, I feel like, groundbreaking events that happened, particularly in Salem, you know, as a consequence of this movie and what was being shown at that time. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's, you know, in the film itself, I mean, there's, there's except for the, the climactic scene, there's really very little actual witchcraft happening, you know, in, in the film. And you know the, the way that the way that they introduce the way that they bring Jack we, Nicholson. We I mean, hear the noise, but I do want to bring in at this point too. We don't know his name. You're calling him Daryl Van Horn, but at this point he's in this "he who shall not be named" territory. So we're treating him as this. Mm-hmm. What? The whole thing where they can't remember his name until the pearls drop. Sure. Yes. Nobody can remember his name. Like you can't. You know. And this is a theme we see over and over again when we're dealing with magic, this power of naming on both sides of things. Like if you can name it, can you control it? If you can, you know, name it, what does it make it then? Right. Through the power and the act of naming. And I think that's fascinating. Just this, the cinematography of, we just take a minute to appreciate the cinematography of that scene on the stairs with the pearls and Felicia. It just, the timing of it is beautiful. The shot sequence is beautiful. It's amazing. It's amazing. Bye Felicia. Oh, I got that. You're right. We're talking about the evil empire again, which is something that we brought back when we were talking about the Wizard of Oz and how it's particularly relevant today. And this is another kind of evil empire. You know what I mean? He's in this giant house. He has infinite amount of, you know, resources at his disposal and can magic defeat that and yeah. how yeah i mean there's 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 so much there in terms of what he sees his role as and of course the thing that 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 this you know the classic story that this harkens back to is is that relation between between the devil and his his mistresses um you know going back to the to you know malleus Malficarum, and there, there's even a shout out to the Malficarum and the with the, the book that they use. We don't know how they know how to do this stuff. There's, it's sort of like implied that they somehow, that he taught them stuff. But I, I gotta think that there were some scenes cut or something like that because, you know, he goes off and then suddenly they know what book to take. They know what, 
is like the only witchcraft in the actual movie and the actual witchcraft in the movie. And they, they know what things to do. They know how to do the wax doll and the hair and all this kind of stuff. It's so damn trope-tastic. Like that's oh, what my yes. notes say, trope-tastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's the point where they finally decide to rebel. And then you get the, the, the famous misogyny speech in the church. You know, do, 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 does God make mistakes and, you know, are women mistakes and, and can we do something about it and all this kind of stuff? Um, you know, it's, it's that classic thing that, okay, is, is, this, is this then the ethos of, of the, the film where, you know, these women are, are somehow acting against this, but yet that's, that's the lot in life that they're given, that they are only ever going to be thorns in men's side, right? Um, well, I so think this is another one of these reasons that I was saying before that people either see it as a feminist text or don't see it as a feminist text. You know, there's a moment of reclaiming in that scene too, I think, you know what I mean? Because they are finally, after being hurt by him, after being, you know, whatever, snake sent, after everything that he came after them with, they're finally retaliating. Mm -hmm. But yet, they're still somehow, you know, Susan Sarandon, do we have to hurt him? As she's, you know, whatever, they're stabbing him. So <laughs> it's just such a, a problematic relationship, I feel right. like, you know what I mean? This isn't, you know, we were making jokes about we were going to paint this with broad strokes and then making hand motions, but it's such a kind of love-hate relationship that they have with all of this. They could have just, you know, whatever, got pregnant and then said later for you, but this is not what's happening here. It's something much more complex. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the way the film ends, right, is that is that they, you know, they, 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 they somehow succeed. They turn him into this little, I don't know, great, great gazoo looking thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but okay, so but they, they stay in the mansion, they raise the kids, because you know, okay, if you haven't seen it, he impregnates them. Um, they they have the triplets, but they stay in the mansion. Mansion. They keep Fidel, the, the you know Lurch, the guy. I know Lurch, Lurch. and um, also from Twin Peaks. I was like, right? wait a minute. <laughs> um, they, they, they keep like the mansion. They, in my the life. they raise the kids in the mansion. They say, we you know, oh, I miss him. Don't you miss him? They're like, yeah, but you, you know, aren't you glad he's not here? Yeah, but I miss him. And then you know, of course, the final thing is is that he shows up. In, in the TV, talk the, the, the wall of TVs, we're watching them for some reason. Um, they realize that they still have control over their power and it's in their bond as, you know, friends, power of three, whatever, we can go down that road. But it's also in their power to triumph despite all these adversities. They're all like struggling at the beginning. They're all, you know, and I, they, we assume that, that, you know, at the end of the film, I honestly think they're way better off than they were to begin with. They're better off financially. They, they've bonded on a deep and abiding level because of the children, because of the circumstances they went through. So I can see why people do see it as a feminist text. I'm not going to sign off on that ending either, but I can see how people would arrive at that, both men, women, whatever gender. But even that invocation, though, seems accidental. And, and, and we don't actually, you know, at the end, we don't actually see them performing any magic then either. So it's, yeah, it is ambiguous, isn't it? Um, but, you know, I, I guess, that, you know, there was a certain need, I think, to sort of encapsulate and, and, and you know, because usually in these, in these witch narratives, you know, the witches are, are, are you know, the end of the films are, the end of the shows, or whatever, are usually meant to assimilate the witches in society or accept them or balance them out somehow. Um, so it's, you know, the, the multiple readings, I think, is, is you know, uh, are interesting points. Um, when I think about, um, again, there, so, so the 2009 remake, I just want to hit that really quick before we, we, we go on, or we, we end, um, is that, uh, of course, they, they, they try to make this into a show, I think, a couple of times, and, and I think in, once in 92, once in 2002, they had, they had pilots that didn't go anywhere. They finally got it done in 2009, and it had Rebecca Romaine in the Cher character. They totally changed the names. The only names that are the only name that's consistent is Daryl Van Horn, um, and they, they sort of mixed around the archetypes. So the the, the, the Michelle Pfeiffer character, who's who's the um, 
uh, the mother of all the kids is now a nurse. And the, uh, the Susan Shrining character is, is the journalist. Um, and they, and they, 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 they divide the archetypes. And again, there's the, there's the three thing there. And <clears throat> there is definitely a made mother crone there, thing there too, but they, they divide them up into powers so that there's um, uh, the share character is, is more sort of uh, clairvoyant and can, can get messages from the dead and visions and all that stuff. The Susan Saranen character uh, can, can uh, uh, sort of manipulate men with her, with her, with her words. And she's kind of like a siren thing, a telekinetic thing. And the, the Michelle Pfeiffer character is the elemental one. You know, she's the, the natural one. That's one of the things, you know, we didn't even talk about with Jack Nicholson is the way that he approaches the women is that he essentializes femininity, but, uh, you know, on the surface as a way to, to, to lift them up. But, but, you know, obviously it's ultimately meant to, you know, bring them down, to, to, to essentialize them in, in a role so that he can then say, well, you know, you're, you're great because you can make babies. Um, feed them, yes. yes right. Yes. Um, but that's also the reason that he can, he can control them too. So anyway, so, so you have this, again, this, this, the elemental character, who's, she has control over the weather and she can heal and all this kind of stuff. And in the show, there's this implication that, that, Daryl Van Horn has visited this town many times and that there are these different generations of women who, who fulfill these archetypes that he can ma manipulate over time. And so you, like, you get an earlier generation that like Sybil Shepherd shows up in the show. And <laughs> well, we all know she's a witch. <laughs> she's the older version of, of, the, of the, the naturalist character. And the one person from the movie that shows up in the show is Veronica Cartwright who is the older version of the Cher character in that she's the more sort of artsy fartsy, you know, uh, 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 having the visions character. So there's this whole weird generational thing. And the funny thing about the show is, um, real quick, is, is that obviously it, it got canceled. Um, it hit 13 episodes. I don't even think they aired all of them. I think they skipped one and then aired the, fina the finale, which I think this was at the time basically when they were hoping to get the back nine, so the, the 22 episodes. So they ended at 13 at a point where they still were, were enamored with Daryl. So that the show ends, <laughs> basically it, it's, it's, it would be as if the movie ended in the balloon ballroom wow. scene. Wow. Um, and, and I think only, at, I think at that point, Rebecca remains the only character who's actually involved with him romantically at that point. Wow. It's, it's a weird thing. But yeah, it's, it's you know, when I was watching it, I was thinking, this kind of reminds me of Gilmore Girls, even though I didn't really watch that show that much. And then I found out that it's act they actually use the same exterior sets. Oh, so, there you go. <laughs> so there's this whole thing about the small town and, and, and the, the quirkiness of it. Oh, that, yeah. It is more hollow. Character. That's great. Right. And, you know, it definitely wouldn't be what it was without, you know, Practical Magic in, in the late 90s, you know, having that more sort of like quirky town type of thing going on. So yeah, they're, they're, it's interesting that the show, um, you know, tries to bring this stuff into the early or late 2000s, I guess, um, but it, 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 it was a ratings flop and didn't go anywhere. Um, but it's I'm definitely- I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by this elemental connection though, you know, because you and I have, I mean, you're in my new book, Water Magic. And <laughs> but to me, it didn't occur to me until we're sitting here talking about it, how, much water plays a part. You know, you're talking about that first scene where he shows up in the rainstorm in the water, and then the scene where he manifests in the end, they're in the pool house, and there's all this water here. So to me, I think that there really is a water undercurrent, pardon the pun, going through all of this in a way that both the magic and the Daryl Van Horn, Ashe energy, whatever juju manifests. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, Again, we're, we're in, in the late '80s. We're left with this with this somewhat ambiguous uh, sense of women having power, but not really. Sure. You know, and and, and I, I think it's gonna it's gonna take, you know, an, into the '90s, into the late '90s, before there's a sense that there's more ownership of that power um, shown on screen through you know depictions of witchcraft. 
and certainly, you know, as, as Laurie Cabot and, and all of the witches at the time were, were talking about, there was certainly no connection to actual, you no, know. No, of course not. Even, even though, um, you know, those practices were, were more or less out in the open by that point um, in the late 80s. Definitely. We need all the uh, pennies and dollar dollars we can get. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for, you know, all of these things, sharing all of these things, helping us get this information out here. This is a difficult time for everybody and we really genuinely appreciate it. So I just want to say thank you on both of us. We've got some great stuff coming up. Uh, we, we're going to be talking about the craft legacy. We're going to be talking about uh, towards the end of the year, Lovecraft Country, and, uh, and lots more. <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying this every episode until we do the Lovecraft yeah, episode. Yeah. You know, when that comes back on, uh, the Supernatural, when that's ending, all of that stuff. So join us. Stay tuned.